Hello and welcome back. If you are new here, my name is Minji. Actually, if you I have been here a while. My name is Minji. I don't think I've ever <laughs> said that before. Minji Linji, my username was something a friend called me in high school, so that's where that came from. But my name is Minji, so I just wanted to formally <laughs> introduce myself with my name since I've never said it on my channel before. But to the actual point of this video, I'm going to be starting a new project soon, and that is going to be Frau by the artist Sakizo. She's a Japanese artist, and I'm super excited to start on this project. It's been something I've been wanting to do for literally years. I even bought some fabric and designed embroidery and lace for it about four years ago, I think. However, the fabric I got is not very good. Um, at the time when I was looking for the fabric, it was really hard to find velvet in a like deep navy blue that wasn't green shifted at all or just like purple so i have a navy blue stretch velvet so it's going to get a lot of linings and things i believe silk baron carries a velvet that would probably be the perfect color for this i haven't gotten a swatch so i can't confirm for sure but if you want to be making this project in the future you should go check them out however it's probably better for my bank account that i bought this fabric a while ago instead of springing for the more expensive actual silk velvet. But if you're looking to make this costume and you have some cash to spend, I really recommend them. The last time I introduced a big project like this, it was for my Alice in Wonderland designed by Hannah Alexander and that was very heavily Victorian inspired. And I did a intro video that gave a lot of historical context for the time period that the costume was most inspired by. I was a lot more familiar with that time period and didn't have to do much narrowing down because I knew it was Victorian just from what it looked like. And there's also a much clearer direct influence for that illustration. I'm less familiar with this time period and it's a lot more ambiguous because it's more fantasy based. So for this video, instead of doing a historical context on any one time period, I'm going to go through the process of how I narrow down the time period that is most likely to have influenced a design made by a fantasy illustrator. As I mentioned in my Alice introduction video, I find this process super important for getting the correct silhouette and using techniques and embellishments that look realistic and are true to the artist's intent. This is all fantasy though and not an exercise in historical recreation, so I will be using modern techniques to sub in for things like basic seams or when I need to recreate a material that's no longer modernly available. Obviously you by no means have to do any of this. Uh, costuming is really whatever you want it to be. However, I really enjoy the research process in addition to the making process. If you like blending your fantasy with historical costumes, then hopefully you will enjoy this too. Okay, so let's get into it. First off, this is all entirely speculation. Sakizo is a Japanese artist, and while I have a minimal amount of Japanese conversation language skills, I definitely do not have the kind of advanced skills necessary to ask her about her creative influences. Because this illustration is named from, my first instinct was to look into German historical clothing. I'm not super familiar with time periods pre-1750s-ish, but my guess is vaguely Renaissance. Mostly I came about this by ruling out other time periods. It's not medieval or pre-1500s Renaissance because there's so much embellishment going on, and, and the skirt and the bodice are two separate pieces rather than a kirtle or a surcoat being the main visible garment. Late 1600s and early 1700s kind of looks like really fancy nightgowns with the mantua, the robe à la française, and the robe à l'anglaise. The robe à la française is really heavily associated with Rococo and Marie Antoinette, who made the style popular and then really unpopular leading into the French Revolution. After that was the far simpler styles of Regency and Empire time periods, which have now recently become popular again with the Bridgerton series. After Regency on Ampere, we get the Victorian period in the mid 1800s. And if you haven't seen my video talking about Victorian fashion, you should go check that out. If you have seen it, you'll notice that there are some similarities between Victorian fashion and kind of Tudor Renaissance fashion. There's big sleeves, big skirts, and lots of embellishment. However, the Tudor silhouette is a little bit more conical while the Victorian silhouette is more cupcakey. Tudor embellishments use quite a bit of gold and precious stones, whereas Victorian embellishments skew a little bit more towards lace and fabric manipulation. So that gives us a period of about 200 years covering the Renaissance from the 1500s to the 1700s. With that narrowed down, I used FIT's fashion timeline to narrow down even more. Their timeline gives a really good descriptor of each decade in European fashion history, so I use it a lot when I'm doing historical costume research. So using their website, I noticed that from the 1640s and on, all of the gowns tend to be a little bit more off-shoulder, which doesn't fit Sakizo's illustration at all. For the 1620s and 1630s, the sleeves are massive, and like the Romantic period, everyone looks a little bit like they're melting. <laughs> So at this point, I've narrowed it down to just the 1500s, which is basically all Tudor. The second half of the 1500s is Elizabethan, and if you're familiar with Queen Elizabeth at all, you'll recognize her giant sleeves, the neck ruffs, and her kind of barrel-ish shaped skirts. Obviously, this is not at all what I'm going for with Frau, so we can strike that out as well. 
Elizabeth was really well known for popularizing the wheel farthingale or the French farthingale, which gave her the kind of barrel skirted look, but the predecessor of the wheel farthingale is the Spanish farthingale, which was brought to England by Catherine of Aragon in 1501. Elizabeth seems to have also worn the Spanish farthingale at some point before she decided she preferred the wheel farthingale, so we'll keep a little bit of Elizabeth's reign in there as well. This gives us a span of about 1500 to 1560, which is much more manageable to research. So at this point, while I've been using kind of Tudor Renaissance to do a lot of my preliminary research, I figured the European countries were still communicating with each other. So I might as well take a look at German fashion at the same time because she did name the illustration Frau for some reason, whether that is like an actual reason that has to do with her historical influences or just because she felt like it. But I figured it was worth a look to check out the 1500 to 1560 time period in German clothing. So I looked for German paintings in the early Renaissance. By far one of the most successful German painters at this time is Lucas Cranach, who became so well known for painting this style of gown that they literally became known as Cranach gowns. I might be pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> This style of gown is really close to how Frau is depicted. Both have quite a bit of gold embellishment and the separation of bust to the rest of the torso with like white and gold embellishment. However, the bodices of the Cranach gown have a diagonal lacing down the front of the torso, which is notably absent in Frau. And even if that were the only significant difference in the bodice, the skirts are very different. Cranach gown looks to be made from a gathered rectangle and it has two stripes running on pretty much every single painting I saw of this style of gown, whereas Frau's gown is definitely very conical and has a lot of lace embellishment rather than stripes. So while this was a pretty good first find, it wasn't quite right, so I kept looking. Eventually, I decided to look at the Pinterest board of one of my professors from my costume production program. He was my main professor for all of my kind of sewing construction, so he taught my ballet class, my uh, draping classes, patterning classes, all of those. But in all of those classes, he gave us a really good thorough costume history. And while I obviously don't have it all memorized, I know that he has a really good, well curated Pinterest board that is gonna be accurate and not include things that are like, I don't know, the standard for Pinterest fake kind of historical things. So I checked out his Pinterest board and he has a Pinterest board dedicated to the Mannerist period of the Renaissance. The portraits from this period kind of seemed exactly what I was going for with the square neckline, a lot of gold embellishments, and puff sleeves that are narrowed down the rest of the arm. The only missing thing was the open skirt where you can see the forepart. But one or two discrepancies can be put down to like the fantasiness of the illustration, especially when that's a difference of embellishment or like style rather than silhouette. However, I was scrolling on Instagram the other day and realized that Saki Zo had updated her Instagram with a new illustration of Frau. The two previous illustrations of Frau that had been released were very like, they didn't show a lot of the front detail. They're pretty much just bust up with her big sleeve muff thing covering her bodice and then a back view. So you didn't get to see any of the front of the bodice or really the front of the skirt at all. This illustration changed that. <laughs> With the new illustration, she very clearly spells out what you couldn't see before, and mannerism no longer fits. First off, what I and quite a few other cosplayers had assumed was a fur muff is actually the cuffs on her sleeves. Her sleeves are bell-shaped rather than fitted at the wrist, and her bodice is a lot longer than I expected it to be. The portraiture from this time depicts most bodices as very short and stopping at the natural waist. Of course, I don't have to do all or any of the details depicted in the new illustration, but I figured, why not? <laughs> I now have the reference and I really love recreating things as accurately as depicted, so I figured that this was more of an opportunity than a roadblock. So this put me back to research. This actually put Frau more in the time period I had liked when I did my really, really preliminary research about four years ago, and this is the reign of Henry VIII. Mannerism actually took place in the same time period as Henry VIII's reign, however, Tudors and Henry VIII are obviously English, whereas mannerism is more of an Italian thing. When I had done my first research, I had really loved Holbein's portrait of Jane Seymour from 1537. It has the correct square neckline, a visible forepart, and lots of jewels, and it even has similar fur detailing, even if it's not in the same place. I kind of forgave the extra embellishment on Frau because Sakizo is really well known for her overly embellished designs. However, I had ruled out this time period because it seemed like all of the sleeves were really fitted in the upper arm and flared out at the wrist, which was the opposite of what I had originally believed Frau's sleeves to do. This time when I was looking specifically for more of Holbein's portraits, I found one of Anne of Cleves from 1539, and she has the same sleeves that I'm looking for. They are a little bit more dramatic than Frau's, but it's still the same concept, which is super exciting because between the two portraits, it basically covers all of the details in Frau. 
that is except for the heavy amounts of ermine and some bodice details but i'm gonna put that down to sakizo trying to make her look more fancy and like nobility i guess so that was my really long research journey and a little bit of dress history hopefully that wasn't too long-winded and boring <laughs> now that i have a very very specific time period of just a few years though i will probably give myself a few decades wiggle room since extant garments from that time are understandably not so common i can start figuring out the specific understructures and undergarments that i'll need like alice this is going to require quite a few undergarments so this is going to be another series that takes a few months the innermost layer is almost always a smock or a chemise or a shift plus some stockings the next layer is a petticoat however unlike what we normally think of as petticoats which is just kind of a bottom half undergarment the Tudor petticoat also included a bodice for support this can include boning or not depending on the decade and the figure of the wearer this kind of replaces what we think of as stays or corsets to support the skirts we'll need to make a Spanish farthingale which will hopefully go better than my journey with the cage kirtle in and then the final undergarment layer is the kirtle which looks kind of like the petticoat but kind of fancier made with nicer fabrics and the petticoat laces up at the back whereas the kirtle can lace up at the sides or the back I'm gonna be making mine lacing up at the sides just a personal preference then I can get into it a little bit easier by myself the kirtle is also visible in the front of the gown so like I've mentioned a couple of times a lot of the portraits had a skirt opening that showed either the kirtle or the forepart the forepart can either be a piece that's like built into the kirtle or is the kirtle itself or it can be a piece that ties on kind of like an apron typically the kirtle is also where you see all of the jeweled embellishments at the neckline however Frau has so much lace and embellishment that a, I think it would be kind of difficult to make the kirtle line up with the bodice really correctly so I'm just going to be embellishing the bodice and the only place that you will see the kirtle on my gown is under the skirts lastly is the gown which at this time period is all one piece that you put on together unlike later time periods but unlike earlier time periods, it is two separate pieces when it's being made that get put together to be worn. Other than that, there's a couple pieces of jewelry in the hat, which are super not time period historically accurate at all, but they're just so cute with all their little snowflakes and icicles, so I'm super excited to work on those. And I think that's everything. <laughs> I'll be breaking everything down more in their individual videos, so if this list was a little rushed, don't worry, there will be lots of info dumping later. <laughs> and. I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I covered a lot of just like my process in the video. I'm going to be covering a little bit more of the historical context in each of the individual videos. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to give me some advice for how to make these things or if I got some stuff just wrong uh, that happens, so let me know in the comments. <laughs> Um, and if you've made this before or you made something similar, if Renaissance is your time period and you have lots of information, I would love to hear it because I really don't know much about this time period at all. If you want to see the rest of the series, then please subscribe. I typically make more sewing heavy videos. Uh, actually, I almost exclusively make sewing heavy videos with some cinematic reveals and then occasional information videos like this to introduce a new project. So if you didn't like this video, then go check out a different video. You might like it better. <laughs> Anyways, that's pretty much it. I gotta get started on figuring out all of my patterns. So I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.